Well, thank you for joining us today on our broadcast. And to start with, just wanted to start out talking a little bit about freedom. You know, we enjoy the freedoms that we have, don't we? And, and mind you, when we think of the freedoms we have as a country, we understand that no man-made government will ever be perfect. But we still have a lot to be thankful for. You know, as I watch the news, often my heart breaks for those nations where the government is just abusing their people. And I wonder if sometimes we take our freedoms for granted. At least I think I struggle with that at times. In illustrating really um, that desire for freedom, Steve Byers in his book Overcoming Bitterness reflects on a true story based on a book called 12 Years a Slave, a book which eventually was made into a movie. It focuses on an African-American man named Solomon Northrup. I don't know if you're familiar with the story. He, he lived prior to the Civil War. That means during Solomon's lifetime, slavery was still strong, had a, strong, had a real stronghold in the southern U.S. But for Solomon, since he was born in New York, that means he was born a free man. You know, Solomon was described as a hard worker. He actually started his own business. He got married. He had three kids. And also, interestingly enough, he became well-known in the area as an excellent fiddle player. One day, his wife um, had decided she was going to take a, a, a job as a cook, but it meant for a couple weeks that she was going to have to be away. It's just a short-term job, from what I understand. And, and so the plan was to take the kids with her as she went out and did this job, and they would be reunited in a couple of weeks. While she was gone, a, a white leader in the community introduced Solomon to, to a couple of men who were from out of town. They actually offered to pay Solomon a, a, a large sum of money if he would play his fiddle in this traveling music show. In this opportunity, obviously, it promised lots of money, but they also promised that he would be back before his family was expected home. Seemed like a nice way to earn some extra dollars for the family. So Solomon agreed. He soon learned that he had been lied to. Shortly into the trip, uh, he was drugged. When he awoke, he was in chains, and he was heading for the deep south, heading into slavery. Solomon had no way of contacting his family or contacting the northern authorities. And now for this young man, his life seemed hopeless. But then, after 12 years, 12 years, a carpenter actually from Canada came to the plantation to build some type of building on the plantation. When the Canadian heard uh, of Solomon's treatment, he agreed to write letters to Solomon's contacts in New York. Months went by and nothing happened. But then one day a carriage showed up. And in the carriage was a sheriff and one of the leaders from New York. And they had come to set Solomon free. Could you consider the moment uh, for, uh, for Solomon who was enslaved? He had no hope. His family gone. No end in sight. And then immediately upon the arrival of a carriage, he is set free. 12 years a slave. Slavery is horrible. W whether it be physical slavery, of which happened to Solomon or Northrop, or, or, or spiritual slavery, that so many find ourselves entrapped in today. Personally, I think bitterness is one of the most enslaving sins. And so today, this is our last message in our series on bitterness. And I want to try to make the most out of this final message. And I want to try to convince you that through the gospel, through the power of Jesus Christ, freedom is possible. Let's just pray as we begin. Lord, once again, we thank you for this time. We thank you uh, for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that he came um, to bring freedom and that through him we can have victory, we can have freedom. And I pray that you just help us to understand the, the riches of your grace. And Lord, so whether it be bitterness or other, whatever sin we are entrapped in, Lord, that we would see that there is hope through the power of the gospel. Lord, help me to speak clearly. Help our hearts and minds to be attentive to your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week, if you tuned in, you saw that I actually provide a study sheet. There was just so many verses from many different parts of the Bible. I thought that would just be the easiest way. I didn't provide that this week. 
There's still a lot going to come at you, but it's mostly found in the book of Ephesians, and then there's one passage in Philippians we'll be looking at. So you might want to get ready in, in Ephesians. We'll be in chapter 2, a little bit in chapter 1, and in chapter 4. But you know, interwoven into each message, this is actually part 5 of our series, and, and I've tried to, anyways, in each message to bring hope by sharing the power of the gospel. And today I want to make it crystal clear why I believe you need to understand the gospel in order to come bitterness. You might ask, well, why is understanding the gospel so important to be set free from something like bitterness? Well, perhaps the best way to answer that question is to point out, more, uh, point out really more of a, a deeper look at the gospel. See, what happens is that when we can see life through the gospel, oh, we begin to see the power of Jesus Christ really on display for us. And that brings us hope, right? Because through the gospel, we understand that Jesus is both willing and able to set us free from the enslaving habits of bitterness. Think about the core of the gospel, right? It's, it's about the, 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 the death, the, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible is very clear that humanity's greatest problem is not environmental issues. It's not. Humanity's greatest problem is not the, the political issues. Humanity's greatest problem is a spiritual problem because our greatest problem is our sin. And that sin separates us from a holy God who's also our creator. Now, follow that statement through, right? It, it says our sin separates us from God who is holy and he's also righteous that means he must punish sin in a just way that means we need a savior that's why that's our greatest need we need a savior who is both willing and able to pay the price for our sin a savior that can rescue us from sin and death to rescue us from being forever separated from God aka hell very quickly, I want to look at some um, terms that Paul uses in the book of Ephesians. So let me turn to chapter 2, because what we're, we're going to do is, is to see um, how deeply enslaved we were. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Some powerful words there. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. So... Sin in general, spiritually speaking, made us dead. Physically, we might still be breathing, right? But spiritually, dead. And think about dead. Dead is dead, right? Dead means being powerless to change our condition. You know, the next verse continues to highlight how hopeless our condition was. Uh, Ephesians 2, verse 2. In which you, and me as well, in which you once walked to the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That means that we were held in the grip of the power of this world, and even Satan himself. And then you look at verse 3, um, you see that Paul describes it, and this is getting even more bleaker. Verse 3, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of her flesh, carrying out the desires of the body, and the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Wow, there's a, a lot of that type of language used in these early chapters of Ephesians. Pa Paul's just making it really clear that we need a redeemer, right? Like we're, we were dead uh, in, in our transgressions or, or sins. We need a savior because like in terms of the way our minds work, they were darkened, right? The, the futility of our minds, the darkened understanding, and that condition, we understand, that separated us from God. Now, I'm not really trying to alarm you with that truth, but I do want us to reflect on truths like this because it helps us to understand the depth of our sin and its effect on us. Right? And so when we can look at and see the destructive nature of sin, just, just in general, and we can see that the hold that it can have on us, it's no wonder why something like bitterness can feel like such a, a deep and hopeless pit. Bitter thoughts, their words and actions, they, they're powerful, they're enslaving, 
Because that is exactly what sin is. Thankfully, we don't just learn about our sinful condition and walk away, right? Especially in the context of understanding bitterness. However, when, when we do better appreciate our fallen condition, it sure makes the gospel shine, doesn't it? It shines so much brighter. Again, using the book of Ephesians, Paul offers us great news. Because you and I, like we were, just some, we were not some abandoned project. We, we weren't just left there to suffer in our condition. Savior has come. And Jesus offers redemption through his blood. Now when you hear a word like redemption, that's, that's like slave language, right? It, it means that you and I were slaves to sin. And we have been purchased or we have been bought back. We have been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have forgiveness of sin. And all of that is according to the riches of his grace. And that is good news. You see, what happens when we repent of our sins and when we turn to Jesus, we're alive in Christ. Again, staying in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. Even when we are dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, and by grace you have been saved. And then he goes on to describe that we're also connected. Verse 6, and listen to the with him, okay? And raised us up with him, talking about Jesus, seated us with him, where? In the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And now listen to this. This is what's ahead for us. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So you're probably thinking, okay, I'm getting all that. But I'm still not making this connection with bitterness. Well, Steve Virus pointed out, he says, you know, a healthy understanding of the gospel can change how we think about overcoming bitterness. See, I hope that throughout this series you haven't gotten the impression that I'm just saying, oh, you know, you want to change, you want to be freed from bitterness? Ah, you just got to pull up those bootstraps, you know, just kind of get with it, as if that's going to work. In fact, kind of a human self-centered focus on growing and changing with anything is not going to work, right? And that's why Paul argues for the, that this gospel way, this gospel way to, to approach life and issues. The book of Ephesians is about... There's a lot of serious theology in the book of Ephesians. But it's there so we can experience some serious change. And to back up a little bit, go, go back to Ephesians chapter 1. I want to just kind of read the segment of Paul's prayer and just listen to what his desire is for these people. Chapter 1, verse 18. And I love this first phrase. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Wow, the eyes of your heart enlightened. Uh, and, and so what does he want them to see? That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. See, whatever enslavement you find yourself in, Paul's appeal is that you would let the eyes of your heart see the hope that you have because Jesus Christ is your Lord. And that's why to deal with bitterness, or really any other sin, we need a gospel-saturated approach. And, and the hope, is, this isn't just some positive thinking thing. This is genuine hope, which means we don't have to remain in the condition of bitterness. I love what Vyra says. He says, our hope is not in the, the person in the mirror, right? Our hope is, that's not our hope. Our hope is in the eternal love of our Savior. Well, I know, at least I hope through this series, you've learned a lot about bitterness. But again, I want to make one final plea why I believe you need to be freed from bitterness. And much of this plea really is based on what bitterness says about your heart. Remember, think about the heart again. In our heart, that's what, what's in there is what we believe about God. right? In there is what we really believe about ourselves and, and about those around us. In our heart, even what we believe about our circumstances. And so once again, we're going to go back to kind of our poster child for bitterness, Esau. And, and 
when we look at him, we can see where bitterness took his heart. Well, we know that Esau sold his birthright for a meal, and then, and then we're told that he despised his birthright. So what does that tell us? Well, clearly, he believed in his heart that his birthright wasn't important, right? In terms of his affections or what he loved, what do we know? Well, it wasn't a God thing. He didn't love God or didn't care about the purposes of God in his life. If he's willing to sell what God gave him for a meal, Esau showed that in his mind, God was not worthy of his trust or devotion. Otherwise, how could have Esau felt justified and even despising what God had done for him and despising God's plan for his life? Esau even showed us what he even thought about himself. Right? I, I, he was clearly the center of his universe and his desires in his mind should reign supreme. He saw his bad choices put on display how bitterness corrupts our heart. And this is my point. In fact, I started this in my notes. So if you, could, if you want to write one thing down, this would be it. Because here's my point. Bitterness is not just sinful. What makes bitterness so dangerous is that bitterness messes with our core beliefs. Right? It, it messes with how we view God, and how we view others, and how we view ourselves. And, and that's why we can never change until we give careful attention to what we actually do believe. You know, honestly, a good ex exercise for you would be to, you know, maybe just think about some past decisions that you have made. Right, just in the quietness of, of your day, if you can find a moment, just think about some decisions that you have made, maybe in the last few months even, and, and, and examine them. And, and what does that, that say about what you want, about what you love? What does it say about what you think about God? Or what do you think about others? Consider this, in biblical counseling circles, and you've probably heard me uh, use this phrase often, but basically... All of us, we do what we do because we want what we want, right? And, and that's true. But what I want to go here is a little deeper because we want what we want because we believe what we believe. You know, I think, just generally speaking, it's a whole lot easier to see the sins of others, right? And, and the challenge is hey, we can get so focused on what others are doing wrong, at least what we think are doing wrong, it is really easy to fail to, to see the sins that are in our own heart. So in terms of the circumstances we face, you know, in terms of those ones that, that tend to make us bitter, usually we don't have any control over them, right? And, and so if these situations are coming at us that we can't change, but the hope is as followers of Jesus Christ, we can change how we handle these circumstances. The power of Christ by its very nature means that whatever you're facing, whatever bitter circumstances are coming your way, you can change. Imagine if Esau had cultivated a heart that truly loved and honored God, but he didn't change, did he? How many times have we become bitter in our hearts? Because the reality is we wanted something else other than God. Think about what bitterness says about what we're wanting. Like Esau, we want like instant gratification to whatever we are longing for. It means that we've gone from, oh, I, I want this. That's long gone. I mean, it's no longer we want. We must have. There's a, something that we must have. It means now that, that, it, it, that, that, that people and circumstances in, in, in our life, well, they must give us what, what I have to have, which I feel I deserve. It means our focus is less on God, less on serving others. It's becoming more me-oriented, more on my desires, what I am wanting. And one of the scariest attributes of bitterness is that it degrades our ability to discern truth. And that might surprise you, but I'm telling you, when I read that Steve Byers book, that really resonated with me because I have seen that happen multiple times. People that are gripped by bitterness, I'm telling you, what they do is that they begin to rationalize their sin. And to do that, they have to create these false narratives to explain their stories. And, and they begin to repeat this, this thinking in their minds until and, and, and they begin to think that this lie is really truth. 
consider Esau. He got to a point where he thought, oh, my brother stole my birthright. That's not true at all. Esau sold his birthright. But that type of deception, that type of you know, mental gymnastics that go on in the, the mind shouldn't surprise us. In, in fact, if you, if you go to Ephesians 4, 17, listen to how Paul describes actually the unsaved lifestyle and just see how that messes with our reasoning and our understanding. He says, this is verse 17, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do and the futility of their minds. He says, uh, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. Wow. Esau thought what he thought because he wanted what he wanted. And he believed what he believed. And and bitterness not only corrupts our our belief about God and our our belief about others, it not only turns us more inward in our thinking and we become more selfish, it not only negatively impacts our, our ability to discern truth. Guess what else bitterness does? Bitterness affects our words, our speech. And our words now become weapons, right? Harmful weapons. Whoever came up with the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names never hurt. Like, like, that, 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 that's not true. Words can hurt because words are powerful. We can use words to build people up, right? We can use words to show God's grace. But one of the natural outgrowths of a bitter heart is that we use words to tear people down, words to destroy. And somehow we can twist all these things to justify, well, can they had it coming to them, or I was just trying to help them, or whatever. Consider the words of Esau. Remember, his core beliefs about God and others were wrong. Uh, his desires, self-driven. And it is, in his thinking, he had determined, oh, I lost my birthright. Uh, it was un, unimportant. It, it, um, you know what? I, what I crave is number one. But remember his words. After now believing that his brother had stole his birthright, how is this, what comes out of his mouth? He uses words to threaten his brother, to, to explain his murderous plans to kill his brother. Byer said that unrestrained sinful bitterness always results in behavior that dishonors God and harms others. And and Esau is an example of that, right? Remember, Esau cried out, the Bible tells us, with an exceeding great and bitter cry. The book of Hebrews tells us that even though he cried, he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. You know, over the years, if you know Esau's story, his angers towards his brother subsided. Um, But from what the New Testament says about Esau, I don't believe that Esau ever changed. I I think bitterness specifically continued to grip him. But I I say that because your life can be different. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ as this child, you are a child of the King, and you can change. And the Gospel gives evidence to that. Again, now we're going to turn to Philippians. Don't lose your, your, your hold on Ephesians. We'll be back there. But I want to turn to Philippians chapter 3. Again, this is the the words of Paul. And I want you to just look at this statement. Because Paul is trying at this point, he's trying to convince his readers that you can change. It, It is possible. And to make his argument, what he does, he puts the power of Christ on display. This is a powerful, powerful. This is Philippians 3, verse 17. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have on us. For many whom I've often told you about and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And listen to this. He says, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Their glory is in their shame and with their minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. From, from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform, this is what, zero in on this, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So think of this as an invitation. He's like saying, hey, 
I want you to join me. I want you to join me in my beliefs about God. I want you to join me in my beliefs about others. I want, you to, I want you to have the same desires as I have, the same thoughts, because Paul knew that such a change would result in their thoughts and their actions. It would change them in such a way that it would honor God. And that change is possible for you and I because we have a Savior. Verse 21. Look at it this way. Since Jesus is powerful... How powerful is he? Well, he's powerful enough to be raised from the dead. He's powerful enough to raise us from the dead. Powerful enough to subject all things to himself. Means if you want to change the power that transformed you into a child of God, the power that promises to transform you when you're dead, also has the power to transform you from bitterness right now. We can change. God is most honored when we change through his power. But I'm telling you that this type of growth requires a gospel-centered focus on our living. We need to see life through the lens of the gospel. If you're going to ignore what I'm saying, and you're just going to do life kind of driven by your feelings and your desires, rather than living by the principles of God's word, I guarantee this, what is going to happen is that your life is going to be filled with idols. And your love for your idol, whatever that would be, it is going to rule you, and it's going to cause you to guard that idol, that because you, you're that's what you really want, that's what you're really desiring, and you are going to guard that at really at any expense. So regarding bitterness, think of it: if, if we lean into our emotions and our desires when a bitter circumstance comes our way, then these idolatrous desires that 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 we have been growing. How are we going to respond when these bitter circumstances come? Well, let's just hurt them back. Uh, you know what? Let's just get, cut them off. That will show them. Or let's just make them pay. Right? But as Christians, we have an alternative. And that is a we run to the throne of grace. And, and that is where we find mercy and grace in our time of need. That's what the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 4.16. Okay, so uh, let's get a little more practical here. How do we change? Right? Uh, well, to start with, consider those times when, okay, let's say when we talked about allowing your, your emotions um, and maybe your gut, you know, I, I just got to go by my gut. You, think of those times where you've allowed that to, to, to rule in your life as opposed to God's word. And, and think of an instance where th that you know that that was the case and you reacted poorly and that's, think to yourself, okay, what would this have looked like if I replaced that poor reaction and I did it rather with a response that honored God. Well, that's a really good question to, to ask because, first off, that admits that we did do wrong and, and, and that we're seeking to replace those actions with, with actions and attitudes that are truth-centered. Well, to help us with this, we're going to turn now to Ephesians 4. We looked at this actually last week very quickly, and we're going to unpack it a little more. But remember, by this point in the, the book, Paul has provided a lot of theology. There is just so much theology in the book of Ephesians. The first half is loaded with it. The back half of the book is much more practical because now he's, okay, you've got this truth. Now I want you to live according to that truth. And this is what it looks like. And in, in Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, it is so clear how change works. I'm telling you, you need to understand this. So this is Ephesians 4, verse 22. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Okay? And then he calls us, and be renewed by the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay, so put off and put on. This is like a clothing illustration. You, you, if you know me at all, you probably know I like to wear running shoes. I know, I, you know it's not the most stylish at times. In fact, you can't see it right now, but I'm actually wearing running shoes right, right now. Back in the day, when I worked in a control room and I'd be working night shift, you could already guess what I'd be wearing, right? Yeah, it, it'd be running shoes. And, but here's, here's why I mention that, because if something went wrong on that night shift, and I had to leave that control room and be dispatched to somewhere else, running shoes got to go. 
I, I, if I was going to investigate the problem, I'd have to like, you know, scooch to my locker, um, get my steel toed dielectric work boots, and, and replace these running shoes with work boots. Because when I did that, I would be able to enjoy the protection that those boots provided me. So, old shoes had to come off. Work boots had to come on. Point being, I couldn't wear both. And Paul is telling us that Christians grow by stopping what is wrong in their heart and in their behavior, and they replace them with approaches with ones that please God. Can't wear both. This is far different from the world's approach, right? Which generally just says, oh, just, just stop doing what's wrong. Just, just stop doing that. Just stop doing that. No, this is, this is way different than that. You know, kind of the classic examples to, to you know, kind of work this through in, on, in, a, in, a, in some type of moral situation is, uh, is lying and stealing. So you ask the question, when does a, a liar become truthful? It's not just when he stops lying. It's good when he stops lying, but it's not, that's not the, the end of it. it. He stops becoming a liar when he's placed in a tough situation which he normally would lie to get out of, and instead of lying, he replaces it with telling the truth. When does a thief stop being a thief? Not just when he stops stealing. It's great that he stops stealing, but he replaces that stealing with actually giving. And he's like, okay, I get that, but I don't know if you realize this, Sean. We're talking about bitterness. How does this work with bitterness? Well, when a tough situation comes your way, let's just say you've lost your job. And instead of concluding, uh, because of that, God's not worthy of my trust in that situation, and, and you know, I'm, instead of despising God that he has allowed this to happen to you, rather, you, you put that off, and what do you put on? You believe by faith that God is good. You know rather than having all that doubt and fear, you understand he is merciful and trust. So, what's that look like? Job or no job, you're going to trust him. You're going to give thanks to him because you know by faith that ultimately he is working for your good. Let's say someone's hurt you or abused you. I'm going to put off looking to hurt them back. I'm going to put off trying to cut them off. I'm going to put off trying to make them pay somehow. And I'm going to love them because I know the Bible says i got to love even my enemies. And if that's God's desire for me, that's what I want to do, even when I don't feel like it. See, a lot of this boils down to, again, what we believe. What is our faith in? So the question for you, do you really believe that the Bible is God's word? Because if you do, that means that we are obligated to obey it. Right? I, I remember... Um, a long time ago, hearing James McDonald say this about faith. He says, faith is believing the word of God and acting upon it, no matter how I feel, because God promises a good result. Well, you know, Solomon Northrup is a powerful example. And I'm sure that's going to stick with all of us for quite some time. It, it gives us a real example of what it means to be deceived, captured, taken away. The story helps us to understand what it would feel like to be unable to be free from your own power. But one element of that story that really doesn't pertain to our topic of bitterness is this. Solomon Northrup, to the best of my knowledge, didn't end up being a slave because of, that he did anything wrong. It, he didn't do anything wrong. He was an entrepreneur. I, I think he was honestly trying to use the time that his family was away to, to try better provide for them. But for us... Sin is a choice. If you are still content to hold a grudge towards someone, you're still okay trying to hurt someone who has hurt you, you have made that choice. That is on you. And you are choosing to have a wrong view of God. You are choosing to have a wrong view of yourself and a wrong view of others. And what is happening, like with Esau, your ability to discern truth is going to diminish the longer that you choose to rebel against God's ways. Your choices are leading you to bondage, and it will take you somewhere where you don't want to go. Remember, sin by its nature deceives. It destroys. It kills. Personally, I think of bitterness as a sin on steroids. Well, there's much more I could say on this, and I do plan to say more on this topic next summer. 
the Lord willing, in our next summer series, uh, we'll co- come back to this. And, and if, let me just also say that if you are part of the FBC church family and you'd like a copy of the book that I base this on, it is so, such a powerful and helpful book, easy to understand. I will provide that for you. But let me conclude this way. If you feel entrapped, enslaved by bitterness, but you honestly want to change, I believe that God is powerful enough to help you change. Because He is the God that can change our heart. But the change that I am talking about assumes that you are a child of God. So I need to ask you, is there a definitive time in your life that you admitted your need and you placed your faith and trust in the redeeming work of Jesus Christ? If not, what is stopping you? And fellow follower of Jesus Christ, if you have placed your faith in Jesus, will you commit to doing life through the lens of the gospel? Putting to death any thought, any action that would displease the God that made you. The God that, he not only made you, he loves you and he wants to lavish you with his blessing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you again that we can just study this important topic of bitterness. We thank you, Lord, that your word is sufficient in all areas of life and godliness, and this is just an example of that. Lord, we know that we continue to have the sinful nature, even though we are your children. And Lord, we can be drawn easily into the dark side of these things, and and Lord, abandon what your word um, would have us to do. Lord, may we just commit in a renewed way to believe right things about you and and about others and about ourselves, that we would live life in a way that would please you and honor you. And Lord, so we just thank you and we praise you in your name. Amen. Well, thank you once again for joining us in our broadcast. If we can help you in any way, um, we'd love to hear from you. And if this has been a blessing, we'd also love to hear from you. So take care and we'll see you next week.